I mean, I would argue this next, this next panel, this next conversation is probably one of the most important conversations of the entire weekend. Because I need to get you guys off of this bandwagon, this, this uh, I gotta make more. You gotta learn how to make your money grow. Yes, that's right. So complete notary mentorship. We're gonna start teaching more financial education principles. Today, uh, uh, this conversation is gonna be absolutely amazing. I've seen the presentation, it's, it's, it's a game changer. Um, so what I'm gonna tell you is, is this next gentleman is, is a friend of the loan signing system. Uh, Dustin Tenbrook is not only a buddy of mine, um, but he's one of the smartest financial dudes I know. He uh, usually, his average client has a million dollars of assets under management. So usually you can't talk to him unless you have a million bucks in your bank account. And so he is coming to this stage today to help you out. So can we all give a big round of applause to my boy, Dustin Tenbrook, CEO of Presidio Capital. Yeah, buddy. Hi, right, man. Go get him, dog. Love you, man. Loan Sighting System Conference, how we doing? <laughs> All right. Good conference so far? How many people here at conference for your first time? Let me hear you. <laughs> Woo! Wow, good for you. Good for you. How many people, let me hear you really loud. How many people are listening, live streaming at home? <laughs> yeah, I can almost hear them. How many people were at conference last year and are back this year? Let me hear you. All right, good to see you again. You guys came to conference last year, listened to me, said, oh, I'm gonna go invest in the stock market. How's that working out? <laughs> yeah, all right, have some hard times. Man, I'm excited. You guys excited? I can feel my heart beating. I think I might be a little bit nervous. Not because I'm on stage, I'm a show pony, I love this. I'm nervous because of this economy, man. It's different, right? It's different than it used to be. It's time for an EKG. Just let's monitor our heart rate, make sure it's still beating. You know, you look at this picture and this is kind of what business looks like. This is kind of what the stock market looks like. This is how econ economies work, right? We have these ups, these peaks, these valleys, these downs, but we can't, it's just all part of the process, right? We can't get so in tune, they're very temporary. Okay, we can't let it discourage us. Because really what it looks like over time is this, right? We know these downs are temporary, but things go up permanently, right? Look, what do most people do during the hard times? Okay, most people are going to earn less. Most people are going to keep less. And most people are going to grow less. Okay, but I want to learn how to EKG. That's what our talk is about over this next hour. I'm going to give you lots of wisdom and advice, actionable things that you can do today. Right now, I hope that you do, take one, two, three things from this next hour and put those into practice and take some action so that let us earn more by working harder, using all these tools, tips, and strategies that you're getting during this conference, right? Learning how to manage our spending, save more, keep more, and then finally, how we can then grow that money that we earn, we work so hard for, that we can keep at least some of it and then make good investing decisions so we can watch it grow. Ladies and gentlemen, that's how you achieve financial freedom and financial independence, because once it grows, guess what it does? It earns for you, right? And that's the whole goal, okay? So let's talk about earning money. You guys want to earn more money? Yeah. Look, things are harder right now than they were last year. I know that. They are for my business as well. Okay, I'm with you. I'm feeling it. Okay, I basically sell the value of the stock market. That's not going up. That hasn't been going too well. Right? You guys have seen some challenges right now. The reality is that most of the time we have good times. Most of the time. Some of the time we have hard times. And what we do in these hard times is what really matters. And sometimes it just seems like it's going to go on forever. We could get defeated. We can't let that voice go on in our head and listen to it. And it's going to come. Right? A lot of people aren't here at conference that should have been. A lot of people aren't listening at home on the live stream. Right? Those hard times have already caught up with them. Okay? The reality is, is that hard times don't last that long. Okay? So I got a lot going on on this slide. Okay? So let me just explain it to you. If I look back at the stock market, which are the value of companies over the last 80 years, okay? and so our companies are going to be valued kind of like the stock market is too. Right? And the stock market is becoming worth more, companies are worth more, our companies are becoming worth more. 
What color do you see the most up here? Right, you see blue, those are called bull markets. Okay, that's when your businesses are growing by 15%, 20%, 26% annually. They last for pretty long periods of time. Those are the good times, okay? What do we see down here in these yellow? We see bear markets, these are the tough times. They happen. We notice at the end, this is going to June 30 of this year, we are in one of these tough times right now, right? So they happen frequently. They're part of the process. We shouldn't be surprised when they do happen, but they are much less significant than compared to the good times. Do we see that? Okay, the next thing we see are these gray areas. Those are called recessions. Okay, we do see that those happen frequently, but they also don't last that long. Okay, and you should have a copy of this slide deck so you can dissect this as much as you want, but we're talking about nine months, three months, one and a half years. Okay, we do have hard times, but what we do in the hard times is what really matters if we wanna earn more money, okay? Good times help mediocre businesses succeed. Good times help people who don't work hard succeed. Okay, that's just the reality, that's, that's the truth. So what were you dealing with last year? There was a lot of demand, okay? It was good times. We'll go through and look at how good they were. It was really good times. But also what you have is a lot of competition. And if you could just fall out of bed and, and put together a work week or a half a work week, you were gonna do something, okay? Mediocre businesses can survive in really good times, okay? They're not going to survive during the hard times, okay? It's gonna be too difficult. They're gonna give up. What happens during the hard times is that it helps better businesses succeed. And that's you, that's why I love being on stage talking to this group. You are the better businesses, you are here. You don't realize yet how much of your competition has already quit. They've already given up. They might still be in the ring fighting another one or two rounds, but it's over, right? It's over, it's already happening. I have seen this happen firsthand in my life. Okay, so better businesses succeed during those hard times because guess what's on the other side of this is the good times that are long and enduring and that competition is not gonna be there, right? Those key relationships that are looking for help, all those relationships you're building, how are they gonna feel when those other people have now quit and left them in the lurch? It's opportunity for you, okay? That's why we work harder during these hard times. Hard times reward hard work. Okay, a lot of this conference I know is about that, but it's the truth. And we just know that as people look at these hard times, so many people are gonna give up. And we don't want that to be us, okay? Look, I, I almost was this person in my career. I started my career as a financial advisor in 2005. It was right at the end of hard times, okay? My first son was born in 2007, okay? My next one in 2010. This were hard times. In 2008, Lehman Brothers went out of business. We went through the worst recession, the worst stock market we've ever had since the Great Depression. I'm not kidding. I won't say I thought about quitting every day, but multiple times a week. Multiple times a week, I thought about quitting. Instead, I did use the opportunity to work harder, personally. 10, 12 hour days, five, six, seven days a week, you know, and then 2012, as we were getting out of the recession, I opened up the doors to my very own wealth management firm at the age of 30. Thank you, thank you. And you know what? I had no competition. I had no competition. All of the people that I joined, there was like you know, a boiler room situation, 30 people getting their series seven, getting on the trading floor. I could count on one hand how many of those people are still in this business today. I can count how, on one hand how many of the people were in the business after three years, okay? Your competition's already giving up and quitting. Don't let that be us, okay? Because on the other side of this is all that opportunity and where are you gonna then be positioned? And remember, they don't last that long. We're already, what, nine months in, you know? Don't give up, okay? That voice is gonna be in your head that this is too hard. That's not gonna be us, okay? That's not gonna be us. We're gonna keep diligent, keep our head down, keep working, right? All right, now, obviously things are worse. So let's look over some statistics we know. And let's just put this in perspective. So if I look at 30 year mortgage rates, I can see that they have spiked up, right? Since 2001, since last summer. You guys are well aware of this, 
okay? This impacts the business. But let's put this in perspective of where they've been, right? Relative to where many of the people in this room have built their businesses, right? And, and so you're seeing this spike, we see them coming down, but it's not outrageous, okay? How's this gonna play out? Well, if we look at US existing home sales after, after COVID, when nobody was buying homes, there was built up demand and it's come down. Again, if you look since 2010, it's almost still at the high, all time high of existing home sales. Okay, this is good for your business. Okay, and it's temporary. US household formations, still strong demand. This is the future need for housing. This is how many people are out there. 1.8 million new households being formed. This is the future demand for your services. Okay, that's right on the other side. Okay, if we look at US mortgage originations, we had a spike again, and it's come down, but still, looking back since 2006, higher than most, when many of you had built your businesses. So we don't wanna to be too discouraged. Looking at new, new single family home sales, it has come down since last year, but still relatively high compared to history. Okay, so we wanna earn more money, but what we do during these hard times is really gonna set you up to have a wonderful business on the other side of this. You see this, these don't last that long, okay? And so use everything that you're learning in this conference to build that better business. Yes, we have to work harder, but we know that many people won't and that's our opportunity, okay? That's our opportunity, it's not gonna be here forever, okay? So we'll talk about how we can use some goal setting to help motivate us, okay? Some, some specific things we can do to help get that one or two more loan signings each week, each month. Okay, so yeah, we have these big goals, lofty goals that we set for ourselves, getting to the mountaintop, but it could be depressing thinking about how am I gonna ever get there? Okay, so what I wanna focus on are small, actionable goals. If you could do that today, I'd ask you, set at least one financial goal that you would like to accomplish in the next 12 months. Okay, come to conference next year and tell me about it. Right, you can even set several. You know, maybe one of those goals is to pay off your credit card at the end of every month. Okay, paying off the credit card at the end of every month. If, if you haven't achieved this goal, this is your number one financial goal above all else. We don't see people reaching financial freedom and financial independence maintaining a balance on their credit card. So we're gonna talk about keeping our money and spending and some tools and, and strategies that we can do to monitor that. But that's goal number one. Okay, a lot of people say, How, I wanna fund my retirement account. I wanna put money into a Roth IRA. Okay, so if you're under 50, the maximum amount you could put into a Roth IRA is $6,000. Well, Dustin, I don't have just $6,000 laying around. Okay, well, let's break that down. How much is that? That is $115 a week. If you can get, and, and so look, on goal number one, okay, you have to figure out how much money you need every month and translate that into how many loan signings that is. Okay, you have your number. Whatever number that is, that's how you're going to set a goal for yourself to achieve that, okay? It's just math. You're gonna achieve that goal and you're gonna be able to pay off your credit card. How many loan signings? Everybody should know that number, okay? And that is what you need to do. Step one in your business, step one in your financial journey. Okay, step two, if I wanna put it money in a Roth IRA, I'm gonna go get one more a week. If I get one more loan signing a week, I'm going to max out my retirement account. Would that be nice? Okay. Maybe I want to set another lofty goal. Maybe I'm gonna to try to do two more a week. If I could get two extra loan signings a week, I can build an extra $5,000 towards paying down my credit card, putting towards that home purchase I want, building my stock portfolio. And maybe setting a personal spending goal. This will help you manage your credit cards, okay? Who wants to come back to conference next year? All right. So, you know, maybe you make a vacation out of it. Okay, maybe you want to set aside a nice travel budget for yourself next summer, okay? And how many loan signings is that? If I want $3,000 next summer to plan for expenses, excursions, and tickets, and whatnot, I just threw out a number, whatever your number is. Break that down, that's $58 a week. We're talking about another one loan signing a month, right? Two loan signings a month. And so if you break down these small, actionable goals, you will stay on track. Hey, you can't just figure out the big rocks. I want $100,000, I wanna buy a million dollar home, I wanna retire in 20 years. Okay, that's all good, but these little pebbles are what we're gonna focus on because we can manage them and we can make sure are we on track or off track on our bigger goals. Okay, so if you could just do this each week, 
you get to manage your credit card balances, max out your retirement account, save an additional $5,000, take a vacation. That all sounds good, yeah? All right. So earning more money, we're gonna be able to do that, okay, by investing in our business during the hard times and setting goals for ourselves that are actionable to make sure that we're scientific about what we need to do financially for our business. Now, very important is to keeping some of that money. We do all this work, you're here at conference, learning how to earn more money, make more money, and what do we do? It's really hard to keep that money, so we're gonna have to have some discipline. I wanna give you some discipline and some tools that you can use to help keep some of that money, right? You owe it to yourself to keep it. Why don't we keep it? Well, one, we voluntarily give it away, mostly, okay? Some of it is not voluntary. We have to pay bills, pay rent, pay gas. Oh, that gas, oh my gosh, right? But the government also takes it, and we also make some pretty bad investment decisions from time to time. Okay, so let's talk about our spending. We voluntarily give our money away. Okay, and we're seeing this happen right now, right? So some of the statistics too. I've seen US savings rates plummet from last year. Now, we had a spike in savings during COVID because you couldn't spend your money if you wanted to, right? The government was giving you money and you, there was nothing to do with it. Okay, and people went out and they saved a lot, but they also spent a lot, you know, once that was over. So we've seen that come down. So we see savings going down. People kind of got accustomed to this lifestyle style during the good times. They're not making as much and they're still spending the same. And what does that mean? We're seeing credit card balances go up. Okay, we see auto loans going up. Okay, so this is going to be a path to financial destruction. Now, the number one thing that you can do is at least just be aware of your spending. Before you do anything, before you change your habits, if you change your lifestyle, if you sit down and put pen to paper, if you would just be aware of what you're spending and what you're making, you automatically will start doing things and making different decisions, I promise you. Just being aware, not putting our head in the sand and just looking at it, even if it's depressing, just to have that knowledge is key to having financial success. Okay, so one of the things that I would recommend for the, those of you who want to is use this app called Truebill. Anybody have this app on their phone? Anybody download this app on their phone and never use it? <laughs> or they linked their accounts, forgot their password, gave up, right? Of course, little bit of work, guys, little bit of work. This app is amazing. I highly recommend it. You're gonna have this dashboard every day it's gonna sync all of your balances. Yes, occasionally if you change a password, you're gonna to wanna to update it, all right? But it's gonna show you. How much do you have in the bank? What's your credit card balances? How much cash? Do you have any investments? And just having those insights into your spending is key, tracking your net cash position. They'll actually manage subscriptions and reoccurring bills. We use it in my house, guess what? My wife and I found out we had two Spotify uh, subscriptions. I had no idea. We had the family plan under hers. I must have signed up for one years ago and forgot about it, but we were paying for two Spotify accounts, one we weren't using, automatically canceling those subscriptions for us, right? You can create budgets for yourself, but just being aware of what's going on is key. And you get to put the notifications on and be aware, you get to know all of this stuff. Like, hey, here's how, oh, here's how much money you've earned so far. Here's bills remaining to be paid. Here's your current spend. Here's, here's your income and spending each month. Here's what's left for spending over the next 14 days, $125 a day. It's all right there, right? Just having that knowledge will help you make better financial decisions. It's very easy to do. Automates it, does it for you. Okay, so there's a QR code there. If anybody wants to download the app, of course you can find Truebill. I like this, most hated by Xfinity, AT&T, Verizon, right? So it's good. Okay, just being aware of what's going on in your household financially is a very critical step that most people don't do, right? And it takes years for them to get back on track. If you just start the knowledge, I promise you, you'll start making better decisions, even over time, just automatically, okay? It's just gonna happen. A lot of people get depressed when they look at how little they have saved, okay? And I could just tell you, after doing this career for 18 years, it doesn't matter how much people have, whether they had 50,000, 100,000, or a million, everybody feels like they are not doing enough. That is just a common feeling that I have noticed on um, like 99% of people that I have counseled their finances in my career. It's just normal. But if you look at saving statistics in this country, you're not alone, okay? 
So these are the median savings that people have in their retirement accounts based on age. Okay, so if I, if I put 100 people, 100 being the highest, zero being the, one being the lowest, number 50 in that stack, if they're under 30, only has $8,000 saved for their future. If they're 35 to 44, it's 36,000. Okay, 60, 90. It doesn't really matter where you are. If you're at zero, you're not that far off from at least being in the middle. And if you follow this loan signing system, you build this business, you get even close to the 10K a month club, right? If you're in the 8K a month club, that puts you in the top 25 to 30% of income earners in the country. Okay, the top 25 to 30% of income earners in the country. The opportunity is there for you, okay? We gotta keep some of that money. All right, taxes, okay? So taxes, listen, take a sip of coffee, okay? I don't want you falling asleep. Taxes are a pretty boring subject. But it's important, all right? It's important that we at least talk about it a little bit because I get a lot of questions about this from you guys. Okay, and so how can we minimize our taxes? Okay, so we're gonna talk about what are the things we could do, maximizing our tax deductions, understanding tax brackets and how they work, okay, and understanding retirement plans. That's gonna be a good help. All right, so what about maximizing tax deductions? So one thing is to get some good tax advice. Okay, one thing is to have a CPA now. There is all the information for you that exists on the internet. As you're well aware, you can self-educate yourself about anything, any concept that you want from finance or taxes. It's not for all of us. You can also hire professionals to help give you good tax advice, even if that's for one time, right? So getting that right tax advice, that consult could be really valuable, even if it's just a one-time consultation that you pay for and you do your taxes on TurboTax, okay? Which I think is great, by the way. Understanding corporate structure as you scale. What's the right corporate structure to maximize those deductions? To minimize your payroll taxes. Okay, so once your business scales, this might become important. And then when we look at maximizing deductions, I just want to caution you to beware that it's a write-off mentality. Do we know what the it's a write-off mentality is? You guys all guilty of that? New lamp? Yeah, I'm thinking of bringing homeware um, into the store, so that's a write-off. That's a write-off? Yeah. Do you even know what a write-off is? Uh, yeah. It's when you buy something for your business and the government pays you back for it. Oh, and who pays for it? Nobody. You <laughs> write it off. <laughs> who writes it off? I don't know. The government, the write-off people. Oh, what? man. Oh, uh, who's been guilty of that one? Yeah. Okay, so the, it's a write-off mentality. David, okay. We've all been David a time or two. You know, I'll pick up the tab, it's a write-off, right? So let's just understand what the value of a write-off is. And so that I'm gonna take you to our tax code and talk about so something called marginal tax brackets, okay? And so if you wanna minimize your taxes and understand the value of a write-off, you need to know what your marginal tax bracket is. So this is based on your taxable income, so your adjusted gross income, less deductions, and this is gonna say how much you're gonna get back on that write-off, okay? So if, if I take the Smiths who are, have a taxable income of $80,000 and they are married finally and jointly, can we find, oh, they're right here in this bracket, okay? So if the Smiths write off a $1,000 business expense, how much are they going to benefit? How much do they get back? Quick mathematicians in the room, right? I have a 12%, $120, okay? So that $1,000 write-off, they got $120. They're still out $880, okay? Businesses have spending problems too, okay? Much rather pay the 120 and put $880 into an investment account than that write-off, potentially. But just know the value of that write-off. Okay, because it's different. If you are Jess here, who's single, right, maybe not as much deductions, so her $100,000 income actually puts her in this 24% tax bracket. So how much does Jess get back on that very same write-off? $240. So whatever that was, it costs Jess $760, it costs the Smiths $880, and you have to use that as a business owner, entrepreneur, to make those business expense decisions for yourself, okay? 
So that's what the write-off is. It's a portion of it you get back from your taxes and depends on where you are in your business, how valuable those write-offs are. So when you're building your business, okay, those write-offs aren't worth as much. So just beware that it's a write-off mentality and what's actually happening. Okay, we can also use this, one of the number one questions I get from you folks is, which retirement plan should I do? Should I put it into a Roth IRA or a traditional IRA? Should I do Roth 401k or traditional 401k? Okay, so again, we're gonna look at our tax bracket and decide which one's better, because the Smiths, we're gonna use that same 12% tax rate if they get $48 back on their taxes if they put it in a traditional IRA. If they put it into a Roth, you get no tax deduction, okay? Now, the difference is on that Roth, all the growth that they get on this contribution is all tax-free, which is, could be an enormous value down the road versus the $400 that they have in their IRA that only really costs them 352, all the growth they get on that, they're gonna have to end up paying taxes down the line, right? If we look at Jess, you know, her, her situation is, well, because she's in a higher tax bracket, she actually gets $96 back. So it's, a, it's like double the savings if she did a traditional IRA versus the Roth. And if she's looking at her personal financial plan because she's in a higher tax bracket, she might be thinking, hey, now's the time to get these tax savings when I'm in this higher tax bracket. Okay. So if we look at it, here's a nice slide that just summarizes which one to do. Basically, if you're in a higher tax bracket now, okay, you could go traditional 401k, IRA, SEP IRA, get those contributions that are tax deductible. If you're in a lower tax bracket, certainly meaning that 10 or 12% tax rate, I would suggest we might wanna just pay the taxes and have tax-free growth on all that investment savings in a Roth IRA. Does that make sense? All right, you guys got through taxes. Good job. Pat yourself on the back. <laughs> All right. So, you know, the other reason why we don't keep our money is because we make some bad investment decisions. Okay? We want to make some, we, we make bad investment decisions for all kinds of reasons. Okay? And we just want to avoid that because you work really hard to earn the money and you work really hard to keep the money. And so when you're going to invest that money, okay? You want to be very disciplined and making some good decisions for yourself because it's going to matter. And you have to kind of decide whether you're trying to get rich quick or build wealth. Okay, there are different types of investments. I personally have decided I'm not going to get rich quick. Personally, I decided a long time ago that I'm going to work hard, I'm going to earn more, I'm going to keep more, I'm going to invest more, I'm going to grow more, and I'll reach financial independence. Okay, a lot of people want to get rich quick, which could lead us to bad investments. We also get sold bad investments, okay? So we, we are sometimes put our money into things that aren't gonna work out well over the, life, over the long term. And one of the things that I noticed in the chat, right, is one of those things about cash value life insurance. Okay, now there's a big sales team out there, okay, gonna tell you about the benefits of cash value life insurance. Okay, um, and we hear this stuff called infinite banking a lot. Yes, right, we see these people right, telling you about infinite banking, all these new influencers coming out, talking about the benefits of it, stay away, okay? It's not true. These people are either bad at finance or they're bad people, or both. But they're one of the two. Most of them are good people that are just bad at finance. Some of them understand finance, thus they must be bad people, telling people about infinite banking and cash value life insurance. Because compared to nothing, yes, it's better than spending your money. Okay, but I would argue you can build discipline using things like Truebill to understand how much money you're going to keep and then investing that when I would get to the grow portion to save your money into things that are gonna earn a lot more over time. Okay, so when you're looking at these things, just look at the cons, look at what other people say, right? Dave Ramsey has this on his site and helps a lot of people manage their finances. Shows the difference over time of if you did the infinite banking route versus if you put your money in your Roth IRA route. And it's just math. It really is just math. So there's a lot of conflict of interest in all that. So I just caution you about that. Okay. And look, there's a thing that happens in investing. And, and it actually happens in lots of places. Like, uh, 
uh, in, our, in our world psychologically, the phenomenon is called an escalation of commitment phenomenon. Escalation of commitment phenomenon is crazy. It actually happens a lot in cults that are focused on the end of the world. Okay, imagine if you were in a cult. Okay, imagine you joined this cult and you, know, you had to abandon your children, you had to disassociate from your parents, you had to give all of your money away, you had to strip yourself of possessions, maybe you had to offer your spouse, okay? And that's what's happened. Why? Because you're gonna, you know, the alien's gonna come down and rescue you or whatever the heck was. And imagine you did all that, and then you kind of realize, oh my gosh, it's baloney. It's all BS. What have I done? And a lot of people, why do they stay in the cult? Because there's, even if there's a one, like, fraction of a percent of a chance that it's true, it's so hard to admit that you disassociated from your family, you gave up your children and your spouse and all your money and possessions for nothing, right? So this happens in investing too. And so the, one of the first things you want to master too is about a sunk cost. Decisions you've made in the past have no bearing on what you do in the future. So a lot of people say, I've already committed, I've already put this money in, I can't have it not work out. It's gonna cost me money to get out. It's better you do. It's better you stop doing the thing that's not working, start doing the right thing going forward immediately. And don't do that escalation of commitment because it keeps getting worse, right? It happens in lots of areas in life and it happens in investing too, okay? Whether it's cash value, life insurance, Dogecoin, whatever, okay? So the other thing is we invest in things, speaking of Dogecoin, we invest in things that we think only go up. You know, we invest in things because we think it only goes up. You know, the stock market's a crazy place. Investing's a crazy place. We only like to buy when it's more expensive. Isn't that nuts? We only like to buy this stuff when it's more expensive. And when it's on sale, no one's at the store, right? If I was like, hey, I'll sell you this watch for $500, okay? You're like, no. I come back next week, I'll say, sell you, tell you what, the exact same watch that I showed you last week, I'll sell it to you for a thousand. You're like, yes, that's more like it. I like those same exact shares you were offering me last week, but now they're double the price, that's when I want those shares. But that exact same shares, what if, it was, what if they were worth 250? You're like, no, no, no. Raise the price to a thousand, then I'll buy your watch, right? That's what's happening in the stock market, it's crazy, okay? So look, things go up and down. They go down temporarily, they go up permanently. They go down temporarily, they go up permanently. And there's always something to be concerned about. Are you worried about putting your money in the stock market right now? No, good, all right. Somebody from last year. Ah. All right, of course, we always have this wall of worry though. We're fighting wars, okay? There's recessions, there's inflation, there's new presidents, whoever, whoever we're wanting on the, on the, in the seat, right? We have all kinds of things that have gone on looking back over the last 50 years. But somehow it just kept trucking along. If you put $10,000 in the S&P 500 and just walked away, came back 50 years later, it's worth $1.8 million. All this stuff has happened. How many different recessions, wars, oil embargoes, inflation, stagflation, market crashes, 9-11. I mean, the world's always ending if I turn on the news. This is it, this is different this time, but we just keep chugging along. If we have more time, we're gonna be fine. And I talked about what you can do in investing over time last year. So those who are with me in Las Vegas, remember I brought out some products for you? Talked about my shoes, talked about my phone, talked about my iPod, you're like, oh, this is great. I could go and invest in things and make money, and then what happened? Market's down, you're like, Dustin, that didn't work out too well, buddy. I'm just gonna listen to you, right? Stock market's down since I talked to you last. Right, because I said that, had you instead bought these products, instead of buying the iPhone when it came out in 2007, if you used those same dollars to buy the stock of Apple in 2007, it had been worth over $40,000 today. That hunk of junk that I have as a relic is, could have been worth $40,000 in Apple stock. Had I gone back to October 23rd, 2001, and instead of buying the iPod, bought Apple stock, it would have been worth over $160,000 today. 
What if we brought the companies that sold us the products instead of just the products, or at least buy both? Okay. Now, what happened had you gone back in time and done that? If you went to October 23rd, 2001 and actually bought Apple stock when the iPod came out, 18 months later, it was down 25%. Imagine if you sold and missed out on all that growth because the investment just went down. If you did the same thing with the iPhone in 2007, this is literally to the day, 18 months later, it was down 30%. This is just part of investing. Okay? We can't just invest with the notion that things only go up. Imagine if you're like, oh, well, this isn't working. Right? I'm going to sell. Oh, my gosh. I missed out on tens of thousands of dollars of growth right? by making that decision. Or versus if you bought more during this time because it would have been even worth more money than what I'm quoting. You're buying at a lower price. Okay? So we have to understand what we're doing in investing. Over time, our odds of making money go up. Okay? Over time, oh, you know, over five-year investment, if I look at the S&P 500, nine times out of 10, you're making money. 10-year periods of time, it's 10 out of 10. Okay, time is the number one ingredient. If you don't need your money tomorrow, right, I'm going to be a long-term investor. If you do need your money tomorrow, you might not want to invest so aggressively. And I'd also just caution you as well about putting all of your eggs in one basket, okay? So putting it all in one company, putting it all in one investment, it's kind of akin to gambling. Lots of different things can happen. Okay, we're not going to predict when the next iPod, iPhone, or Jordans are going to come out. We should probably have a number of different investments in our portfolio. Okay, it's going to be a little bit better. So that takes us to our next thing, to grow more money. We want to grow more money? How are we doing, conference? All right. All right. Let's talk about growing our money. Okay, the number one question you ask me, the number one question I get asked in my career by all my friends, family, colleagues, and of course clients, the number one question I get asked is, what should I do with my money? I have some extra money, it's sitting around, you're a top wealth manager, certainly you know, what should I do with my money? I'm gonna tell you, okay? As I look at them in their eager eyes, waiting for my answer, just as I'm looking at you, some of you with your pen pressed to paper, and you kind of already feel the disappointment mounting. You kind of already feel, I'm gonna say the thing, you're just, please don't say it, it depends. Oh, come on, man. You're gonna make me work? All right, well, let's just talk about what your options are. Okay, let's just talk about what your options are. Okay, one, I could just leave it in the bank. Okay, of course, I do nothing, so that doesn't require any action, so that's easy. I'm also considering, should I pay down some of my debt, right? This is something that I get asked a lot. Should I pay down my debt or should I invest it? So let's start there. Those are your three first options that you're needing to look at and we're gonna help make a decision for you right now what to do with your money, okay? So our first instinct is what? Don't do anything. Don't do anything, why? One, I might make a bad decision, okay? So if I just sit back and do nothing, I feel a little bit better that I'm not gonna make the wrong choice. I'm just gonna make no choice, okay? The other thing is, well, what if I need it? I kind of hoard my cash, I like to see it. I wanna see it in my bank. What if I need it? You know, I worked hard for this money and to keep this money, I need to just see that it's there. What if I lose it in some investment, you know? So let's first talk about leaving it in the bank versus paying down your debt. Now, very, very important, understanding debt is key to building wealth and having financial freedom and financial success, right? It just should be a whole semester in high school that we learn about this different things, okay? Yes? So I'm gonna teach you, you teach your kids, okay? Here we go. So there's two types of debt that are really critical to understand. There's revolving debt versus installment debt. Okay, and we have to differentiate those two and treat them differently. Installment debt is when I borrowed money like to buy a home or to buy a car or to go to school and I'm guaranteed going to pay back the bank or lender over time at a fixed payment schedule at some interest rate. Okay, that's called installment debt. I'm gonna pay that back over time. Revolving debt are my credit cards or home equity lines of credit. I can borrow money, I can pay them back. I can borrow money, I can pay them back, okay? And when it comes to credit cards, those are usually gonna have the highest interest rates. I can feel free to pay down my revolving debt because if, what if I need it? Well, that's what the credit card's for, 
You know, what if the emergencies happen? So for an emergency fund, if you had a credit card, $8,000, $5,000, $10,000 credit card you didn't use, look, the reality is emergencies usually don't happen. They usually don't happen. But if you did get hit with those hospital bills or that deductible if somebody rear-ended your car, right, or you rear-ended somebody's car, okay, your credit card could be there for you in that moment if that ever happens and it usually doesn't. Okay? So the other thing is I have to look at the interest rates on my debt. So you should be able to do this. Again, Truebill will do this for you. And you'll be able to look at how much you owe on each different type of debt and make very wise, good decisions about what you're going to do with the money that you have in the bank. Whether you have it now or whether it's coming next month, you already want to know what you're going to do with it. So you don't ask me this question. You already have the plan when that money comes in next month, next year. Okay, so what is the rate of return on paying down debt? I can leave it in the bank and earn nothing. I can invest it in the stock market, which is volatile, right? Over time, makes about 10, 11% a year over time, but it could be up and down. Or I can guarantee myself a rate of return, which is just equal to whatever the interest rate is. So if you owe money on credit cards, interest rates are high or low? High. 15, 20, 25%. So if I had $1,000 I owe to my credit card and I could just take $1,000 out of my bank and pay down that credit card, right? I am guaranteeing a return of 20%. Guaranteed return of 20%. If your bank offered you a savings account that guaranteed you 20% rate of return, how much money would you be trying to stuff into that account? That'd be a pretty easy decision and I'd be out of a job, right? Don't need it. Guaranteed 20% return. If you own money on credit cards, you got it. Imagine having to pay that and how wealth destruction that could, how wealth destructive that could be versus paying that off, right? So I really counsel us. Again, Truebill shows us this thing called net cash, which is really helpful for me to make these decisions and mentally. I can look at it and say, I have this money, I can use my cash to pay down my debt. And then I notice that once I do that, my net cash doesn't really change. Okay, your net cash. And this could be a negative number. You might owe more on credit cards than you have in the bank. That's fine. Okay, just being aware of this and what to do with that money to chip it away over time, not growing that credit card balance over time is going to really help. So do I leave it in the bank? Okay, what if I need it? Revolving debt, because if I need it, I can go get it and I'm guaranteeing myself a pretty high interest rate if I own any money on credit cards. So that's why that is our number one goal, okay, is to managing that credit card balance. Then I could get to this time frame when I can choose now to invest it. I can look at investing my portfolio in the stock market, in the bond market, a mixed stock and bond portfolio, or investing in real estate, okay? How many people have a goal to buy more real estate? Let me hear you. So real estate is a phenomenal investment that builds tremendous wealth over time, much like the stock market, okay? And if you don't own a home, it should be your primary goal to become a homeowner, all right? And I'm sure many of you who don't own a home, it already is. Many of you own a home, probably want another one or an investment property, okay? To invest in real estate, you have to do everything that I've told you up to this point. Everything that I have said to do up to this point is going to help you buy real estate. You are not going to buy more real estate owing money on your credit cards. You're not going to buy more real estate if you don't earn more and keep more. Manage your taxes, max fund IRAs and Roth IRA contributions, build stock portfolios. Okay, all of those things help you accrue more money, earn more money, keep more money, grow more money so that now you have this future nest egg that you can what? Then leverage it to buy that real estate. Okay, so you have to do everything that I've just said up to this point is gonna help you with that goal to buy that real estate. Okay, if I look at these things over time of how to make money, okay, I can look at over the last 25 years, if I put $100,000 in the bank, okay, and it just sat there, I invested in CDs. Over 25 years, I'd barely, barely break even. With inflation, I'm losing money. If I put that money in the stock market, a $100,000 investment in the stock market 25 years ago would be worth $867,000 today. 
Okay, one, one investment. If you said the stock market is too risky, I want to take a balanced approach. I want some stocks, bonds, 60-40 mix of the two. Okay, it's a balanced approach. It's going to be a lot smoother. I'm not going to go down so much in like great recessions and all of this smoother line, but it's still worth $635,000 today after 25 years, right? And real estate has gone up. It's about tripled in value over the last 25 years. So you would have about a hundred thousand dollar property would be worth about 327,000 on average nationally. So why do people say they make so much money in real estate? Right? That doesn't look like it's much better than investing in balanced stocks and bonds. That looks way better. Well, if you had $100,000 25 years ago, you're not going to go buy $100,000 of real estate. What do people do? I'm sure you might know. What do people do when they buy real estate? Why do you have a job? What do people do when they buy real estate? They get a mortgage. And they don't buy $100,000 of real estate. They buy $300,000 of real estate and they leverage that. And now if you triple $300,000, guess what that's worth? $900,000. So that's why investing in stocks, investing in real estate are tremendous wealth creation things. And that real estate could provide you income, it could do all kinds of things, tax benefits. It's a job. Investing in the stock market's easy. You just put your money there and kind of walk away. But there's tremendous opportunities in both of these things. Okay. One of the number one things I hear too when I come and talk to this group is I need to know what to do. What's my first step? Okay, so so far we're looking at Truebill okay, to manage our finances, take that first step to look at our debt. If we're ready to invest, people say, where should I open my account? Which one should I do? Okay, it doesn't matter, all right? I don't care if your money's at Schwab, E-Trade, Fidelity, Vanguard. I was talking to my barber last week and he said he likes investing in real estate, but he really wanted to invest in the stock market. I said, well, do you have a brokerage account? He said, no, I don't. He's kind of embarrassed. I only have a Robinhood account. I'm like, that's a yes. Go for it, man. You could be investing right now. You know, he's like, I only bought Dogecoin on it. I'm like, okay, well, it's true. So look, I see people with multi, multi millions of dollars that have accrued their wealth in Charles Schwab, E-Trade, Fidelity, Vanguard, and wherever else. They're all the same. It's pretty much free, okay? So investing in the stock market is essentially free today. And all of these can easy to open account. They have apps that go to your phone, allow you to invest with no commissions or trade costs. It's a democratized stock market these days. You have easy access and, and zero to a little cost, okay? If you want help managing a portfolio, Okay, there are, are other services out there like robo advisors like Betterment. Okay, anybody here of Betterment? Yeah, couple? Okay, we actually partner, partner with Betterment. I love their services. And you can go to betterment.com, you can check it out. There's zero account minimums. If you have $10, $100, $1, dollars, you can have easy, optimized, personalized portfolios that are managed for you. It's incredible, okay? You get this dashboard where you can actually connect any outside accounts that you have out of Betterment, just like you do in Truebill. It'll feed all in here and start tracking your net worth and showing you your net worth over time. And we wanna watch that grow. Okay, track your savings, view your performance, move money, okay? Look at your earnings on what you've earned, manage your deposits. So like those goals I was just talking about, okay, this individual is right on track. Then May 15th, they put $500 towards their build wealth portfolio. It's one of their goals to build wealth. They're doing $500 a month, however many loan signs. Safety net, I want to build my emergency fund. I'm going to automatically have $300 go to that and $300 go to my dream home fund. You make those goals. You personalize those goals to help you stay on track of achieving them. And the portfolio construction that you do is akin to what we do in our wealth management firm for very wealthy people. Okay, they'll take and help you identify your time horizon because that's the number one ingredient. How long do you have to invest? We know the longer time we have, the more risk we take, the more opportunity we have for us. Set these goals. Goal setting is so important, not only to help you keep and grow wealth, but it actually helps you earn more money to go get that one more loan signing so that you can max out that Roth IRA. The same is your risk assessment, right? You don't have to watch your money be so volatile. If that's going to freak you out, make you panic and sell, then you can have a smoother ride, have a more balanced approach. 
that delivers asset allocation. This is advanced stuff that we do for people okay, at our firm. Building a core portfolio of exchange-traded funds, investing in hundreds of companies, stocks, bonds, globally in your portfolio. Okay? And they also allow you to even do core satellite investing. Core satellite is a very advanced concept that we do. Okay? That is now democratized. What is a satellite? So you have your core. You have your core investments that you want to invest in to help grow. But you can also say, I want 20% of my money to be invested in just innovative technology companies. Or I, want, I really care, is my money doing some good on this planet? I think that the world that we're building for the future is going to reward companies that make a broad impact, a climate impact, a social impact. Or I want some of my investments to, to change in, uh, direction in certain markets, become a little bit more cautious when times are tough, be a little more aggressive when the, the wind's at our back. Okay? And you can build these core portfolios. It is really, really amazing. Here's the cost. Okay? If, you're, if you're worried about it or what's the next step, very easy to do online, okay? There's zero minimum. It's, it's a quarter of a percent that they charge you to do all of this. And so for every $100,000, you're paying $250 a year. That's it. To do everything that I just said is for every $100,000, and there's no minimum, so you can have $1,000 in there, you still get everything that I just said, okay? That's, that's the cost. If you have other things going on. Once you've billed your account to $100,000 or grouped all of your accounts over hundred grand, you might not need some higher end advice on what to do with what's going on in your finances. And they, for a premium of now 40 basis points, so an extra $150, you could have access to their team of certified financial planners. Work with graduates that are CFP professionals that can help answer any of your questions and they can answer almost all of your questions, okay? If you grow your account larger, you need more advice, you can partner with firms like mine that are Betterment Advisors, right? Our costs are higher, our minimums are higher, the services are higher, but not until you, need, not until you get there do you need them. All of this stuff that I just said that they do is very inexpensive and accessible, okay? So if we're gonna close, right, what's the worst thing that you can do right now with your investments, all right? Don't want to panic. We're not cashing out. Okay? What's the best thing that we can do? What's the best thing you can do when the market goes down? Right? We want to buy more. Okay? Remember, history tells us these hard times reward hard work. Okay? Hard times are going to help better businesses succeed. Okay? So let us please earn more, keep more, grow more money. Are we going to take a couple things that we learned here in this presentation and put them into action? All right, it's time for an EKG. Everybody, thank you. It's so nice to be here on conference today. Enjoy the rest of your conference 2022. Oh, man. My man. Oh, fire per the usual. Thank you so, so much. Um, and that's a wrap. Can we give it up for my man, Dustin, please? I got, I got one more offer. I just oh, want to say. I know why is everyone getting up, by the way? Just one more okay. for. You know, my ballers in the room that are hitting it during these times and are stepping up for the charity that I love and support, that Mark loves and support, that you're going to hear about more from a minute. Okay, so uh, for the top three donors, okay, I'm going to offer to build a personalized wealth management plan for you, okay, as well as keep you on track for the next year. Okay, so not only will I build that personalized wealth management plan for you today, I will schedule out the next year of reviews to make sure that you are on track. So when we come back to conference, we have re-strategized, we have built your plan, we have gotten you to the right position, achieving your financial independence. Okay, so for our top three donors, that's what we're gonna do today. So he's gonna build a wealth strategy. But, By the way, he always deals with people who make millions of dollars, so your opportunity. So if you're gonna make a donation, go back to the Promise to Kids booth, uh, largest donation, top three. He will build it out, so but, thank you. Oh. But remember, whatever donation that you give them, it's a tax write-off. Yeah, let's go. Love you, buddy. Thank you, man.